The session is presented by the Embassy of the United States of America in India. The pandemic has provided many parts of the planet a reprieve from the worst effect of pollution, demonstrating that the problem has solution and is at least partially reversible. It has also served as a potent reminder that the burning of fossil fuels is no longer feasible given severe consequences and that alternative measures are imperative for the survival of our planet. An important session that looks at the human cost of air pollution, be it natural or man-made, and the real possibility of change. For the session, I invite Mridula Ramesh. Mridula Ramesh is the author of the critically acclaimed book, The Climate Solution, and the founder of the Sundaram Climate Institute, which focuses on waste and water solutions. Ramesh has worked at McKinsey in Silicon Valley and is the executive director of Sundaram Textiles. She's part of the board of trustees of World, World, uh, sorry, World Wildlife Fund and the chairperson of the board of governors at the Nas National Institute of Technology, Andhra Pradesh. James Nestor, he'll be joining us virtually, is an author and journalist who has written for Scientific American outside the New York Times and more. His latest book, Breathe, The New Science of a Lost Art, was released in May 2020 by Riverhead Penguin Random House and was an instant bestseller for New York Times and London Sunday Times. Breath spent 18 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list in the first year of release and became a bestseller in Spain, Italy, Germany, and Croatia. Joshua Pollock, a dynamic advocate for meditation, is co-author of the best-selling book, The Heartfulness Way, translated into 15 languages. Joshua has led seminar and many institutions such as Amazon, Google, the New York Times, IIT Mumbai, and Columbia University. And he has been featured on ABC, NBC, and CBS television. Neha Sinha is a conservation biologist, author, and columnist. His critically acclaimed first book, Wild and Willful, tells the story of 15 of India's most iconic wild species. Sina has conservation and policy at the Bombay Natural History Society and is a leading commentator on the environment. And she writes for Hindustan Times, The Hindu, Bloomberg, Quint, Telegraph, and others. Now I would like to invite Michael Rosenthal, Director, North India Office, U.S. Embassy in India to introduce the session. Michael Rosenthal. Good morning. Namagani. Namaskar. Aaj apke saath hume ki nimantne ke liye dhanyavad. Ye mere liye ek saman janak baat hai. I'm Michael, and our North India office leads U.S. ties with Rajasthan and other states of North India. It's a pleasure to be here in person with you all, and many of you online at JLF this year. And I'm pleased to introduce this panel, which brings together some of the best thinkers from the United States and India on breathing. As the world's two largest democracies, the United States and India have long been dedicated to working together to improve the lives of our peoples and the world. This commitment has been supported by our governments, by our dynamic and open civil societies, including universities and NGOs, by entrepreneurial private companies, and by creative individuals. As comprehensive global strategic partners, our cooperation has spanned the scope of human endeavor, from defense to trade to 
culture to science. President Biden has committed to working with Prime Minister Modi and India to win the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, to rebuild the global economy in ways that benefit both of our peoples, to address the climate crisis, to stand together against global terrorism, and to promote a free and open Indo-Pacific. At this year's JLF, we are pleased to be sponsoring a series of sessions entitled Raising Women's Voices in Global Health Security, including this session on the freedom to breathe. I look forward to hearing more from the panel on the importance of breathing for individuals, drawing on both of our traditions and our research in the United States and India. And I look forward to hearing more about public policy issues related to breathing, including climate change and air pollution. The United States, drawing on our own experience in addressing air quality, has supported India's efforts to better understand and monitor air pollution through scientific exchange and technological cooperation. The US mission in India has installed air quality monitors in our embassy in New Delhi and our consulates around India and shares that information with the Indian public. We've also provided air quality sensors to schools around India to increase data collection and raise awareness among students. More broadly, Indians and Americans have been working together to reduce household use of solid fuels for cooking and heating, and our experts are collaborating on air quality research, on transparency in industrial emissions, and on new technologies to improve energy efficiency, all of which will benefit the world. We're also working together to understand and address the harmful linkages between air pollution, climate change, and COVID-19. We seek to ensure the contributions from women and the impact on women are at the center of our conversations. There's a lot more to be done, and as leading democracies, we know that we have a special responsibility to the world. But we are confident that we'll be able to draw on the talents and innovative spirits of our peoples to succeed. With that background, I'm pleased to turn over the conversation to our talented pa panelists today. Thank you, and we thank Thank you all for being here uh, and, and to join us for such an important topic, the freedom to breathe. And we have such a wonderful panel, such a diverse sort of, um, it's, it's such a diverse group that we have here on the panel today. So from science journalism to mindfulness, to thinking about water and climate and clean air uh, as, as an intersectional issue. So I'm actually going to start with James uh, because uh, I understand it's very late. So uh, James, I'm going to try to uh, finish your questions first in case you have to leave. And so James Nestor has this incredible book called Breath. And uh, all this time in Asia, we've been thinking that um, it's, the, it's the air that's wrong. You know, we, ha we are under the Asian brown cloud, especially in North India in which you know the air is just so impenetrable and hard to breathe but what james writes about in his book is actually about how we are breathing wrong so especially in asia and south asia and in india this is something of great concern to us we we of course went through multiple waves of the covid pandemic and we are already breathing really bad air so my, actually my first question to james is it's, it's a dummy question. It's, it's one I'm sure he's been asked many times before. But do tell us a bit about how we are breathing wrong, which is the central premise of your book. Over to well, to be, to be clear, uh, pollution is a huge problem. So indoor pollution, outdoor pollution, of course, that affects our ability to breathe. But uh, one of the issues that uh, ha a lot of people aren't thinking about is how our faces have, have literally changed dramatically in just the past few hundred years. And because our faces have changed so much, our airways have grown smaller. So we have dramatically different faces than our ancestors had. And if you don't believe me, all you have to do is look at ancient skulls. They all had perfectly straight teeth and modern skulls don't. So this is a fact, this isn't a theory or a hypothesis. So just the pathway through which you breathe air affects your health, it affects your anxiety levels, it affects your blood pressure and more. And this is something I just don't see taught too much. You can help filter air so much better if you're breathing through your nose 
and so much of the population happens to be mouth breathing and we think that this is perfectly normal but it's really not my second question to you james is you speak about coherent breathing in your book and you just referred to it right now about how we need to breathe uh, from our nose and not our mouth. Could you just tell us a bit more about coherent breathing? I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are very interested. So a lot of people think, well, who cares? I can breathe through my mouth. I might as well breathe through my mouth. It's air is air. But the air you take through your mouth is dramatically different from the air you take through your nose. Your nose is going to filter pathogens out. It helps defend our bodies against viruses. It helps with blood circulation, it humidifies air, so many other things. So another thing to consider is that when you're breathing through the mouth, there's no resistance. I can take a full breath just doing that, it takes a half a second. And that's a problem because breathing more air actually gives us less oxygen if we're breathing over our metabolic needs. This is so confusing, but that's how the biochemistry works out. So this idea of coherent breathing is to breathe right in line with your metabolic needs. It's to coordinate your respiratory rate with your heart rate. And when you do this, the systems of the body enter a state that scientists call coherence. This is the peak efficiency at which your body wants to operate. Most of us, again, are breathing too often. We're overtaxing our bodies all day long. At night, we're snoring or we're struggling to breathe with sleep apnea. So this training yourself to breathe in this very slow, easy way through the nose has numerous benefits to mental health, to physical health, and more. So James, some of the new words we learned in the COVID pandemic were oxygen concentrator. Um, we learned um, you know, a lot about respiratory illnesses. We learned about lung disease. So I think that makes your book even more relevant because we were gasping for breath. We are collectively millions of people gasping for breath during COVID and surely this is not the last pandemic uh, that will hit our earth. So is there something, is there a message you want to give in terms of the fact that not only is air bad and not seeming to get better in terms of the quality of the air we breathe, but the climate is also changing and all the biologists predict we will have more viruses and more uh, life-threatening diseases uh, which will be unleashed upon us. Um, is, there, is there any piece of advice or any perspective you'd like to add on this? Uh, from the prism of breathing? Well, it's only when we lose something do we start to pay attention to it. I think one of the reasons so many people have suddenly gotten interested in breathing and breathing health is because that's what we're denied when we get COVID. So as far as the future is concerned and how things are very quickly changing with climate change and so many other issues, breathing is something that we do all day long and all night long. So from the moment we're born to the very last second we die, we are breathing. And how you take those breaths, the pattern that you take those breaths, the pathway through which you take those breaths, this makes an incredible impact on your health and well-being. It actually, there have been studies that have looked at breathing patterns and the efficiency of blood flow in the brain. So it can actually change how your brain reacts to things, how you breathe. Uh, this is not new, by the way. Uh, you know, 5,000 years ago, uh, people were studying this in the Indus Valley. Um, they called it yoga. We call it breath work now, but it's all the same thing. So I think that if you look at the future and the potential of new viruses and new diseases affecting people, it's essential to have a strong immune system. So having a stronger immune system will help, help you fight off these problems much more easily. And breathing is not going to cure everything for everyone, but it's a part of being healthy, just like eating well is a part of being healthy and sleeping is a part of being healthy. Well, you have to breathe well as, as well if you truly want to have proper health. 
So uh, you've also written a book about Uh, when you thought about the world underwater, because, you know, divers, of course, also, you know, regulate their breath quite a bit, and perhaps they value uh, breathing much more than we do on land. <laughs> well, yeah, the only way to hold your breath for seven, eight, nine minutes at a time is to really understand how to breathe properly. And it turns out that all of the practices that free divers can learn benefit them not just in the water but on land as well so having this flexibility in your rib cage and these intercostals being able to really understand the power of your breath you can then use your breathing to do seemingly impossible things like heat your body up there's been several studies showing that and as i mentioned before it can help heal you of many chronic conditions this sounds like new age junk, but uh, you know, I spent years and years working with leading scientists in the field, and I, I can tell you that it makes an incredible difference to your health. My final question to you is, in many interviews, you've spoken about how you're basically trying to debunk conventional ideas. And as you just said, you know, uh, you've gone back to older practices, 5,000 years old, um, to bring us these new insights, insights that are new for many of us. So how many years did it take you to study for this book? And perhaps there's something to be said about old practices being valuable to us, even in the modern age. Oh, this book took me several years. Don't ever write a book about breathing. It'll, it'll ruin your life for years and years. So it started off for me when I was having a bunch of breathing problems. I was told I was perfectly normal to, to suffer from things like bronchitis every year and mild pneumonia. I was given antibiotics and sent on my way. But I thought after several years of experiencing this that something must be wrong. But I'm a science journalist. I wasn't gonna write a memoir about this. So I just sort of stored that idea of the power of breathing um, in the back of my mind until I saw free divers, until I saw people doing things that are supposed to be scientifically, medically impossible. These things, you are not supposed to be able to heat up your fingers by 17 degrees by breathing. You're not supposed to be able to hold your breath for, for 10 minutes or dive down to 400 feet on a single breath of air. And yet these people are doing it all the time. So it, as a journalist, it makes you question, well, what else don't we know about this seemingly mundane thing? of our breath what else can we learn about it and appreciate about it and one of the things i really like about studying and researching breathing is this is something that's available to everybody everywhere we're doing it all the time it's free and so if even for a short amount of time you're to control your breath a little better you're to breathe a little more healthy there are only benefits to be gained there are no negative side effects to feeling better or to delivering more oxygen to your body or to calming yourself down. That's very inspirational that free divers have led you to this book. Uh, I understand that um, it's very late for you. If you'd like to stay on till the end of the session, that's great. Otherwise, I, I asked you all my questions first, just in case you needed to leave. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. That was so interesting, <laughs> old science and new wisdom. So I'll move to uh, Joshua now. Uh, Josh, you live in Delhi, and um, Delhi is, of course, the most polluted place on earth for many, many years. We make headlines that say that Delhi's air has improved to severe today, or it's improved to dangerous today. So. Uh, I think a lot of us experience ecological grief, you know, the sense that things are changing, the environment is burning, and we're not able to do anything about it. There's been so much dialogue on clean air, but uh, the air hasn't really improved. So my very first question to you is, as somebody who thinks about the inner world, as somebody who thinks about heartfulness, mindfulness, how do you live in Delhi? How do you reconcile 
that external conflict with your internal mind. Well, I I love it's, Delhi. It's actually also advice for my, me because I'm from Delhi. Um, you know, when you ask about uh, ecological grief, uh, generally, I want to dispel the notion because I come here from a perspective of meditation, right? I want to dispel this idea that. Uh, such practices exist in order to paper over such emotions as grief or to sort of paper over anxieties or things like that. These are useful emotions. And actually, if you have a, a sense of ecological grief, then perhaps you can even spin it in a positive light and, and see that it, is a, that it is a prompt for you to act. Right? If you're feeling upset and... Uh, sad about the state of the world, then I think it, it's something that you can make use of. And it's something you can see how you can do something about it, you know? I mean, as for Delhi, I mean, I love living in Delhi. So I don't want to say anything negative about Delhi. Actually. Um, on the other hand, you know, my two-year-old son was in the ICU for three days because, not because of COVID, before COVID only due to breathing issues in the winter in Delhi. So we all know what Delhi can do. My daughter's also been to the hospital a couple of times, not in the ICU, thankfully, because of breathing issues. And then you compare that to the lockdown, March, April of 2020. I mean, we kept, I was looking at, I was you know, keeping a track of the air quality and it was you know, 10, 20. It was amazing. It was so, it smelled nice. It was, there was silence. The birds were chirping. The sky was blue. We threw up, we weren't allowed to go outside. We threw open the doors and windows. We went up on the terrace and enjoyed it. And it showed us how lovely it could be. And the funny thing is, is what lesson do we learn from this? Because I think it's possible to learn the wrong lesson from this too. I think the wrong lesson is that human activity and purity of nature are incompatible. I think that's the wrong lesson. That would be a logical lesson to learn from that because as soon as there was no human activity, we saw nature flourishing. But that's the wrong lesson because it's based on this idea that human activity, that human life and nature are segregated and that they live in a sort of apartheid. And I think that this is a, you know, this is one of the main problems. And I think there's an interesting, you may, you're probably aware of it, but there's an interesting philosophy about conservation too, which takes this into account. And, you know, because what we see when we're trying to preserve nature so much of the time is that you have a reservation, like a wildlife reservation, a national park, and this is a place where there can be no human settlement, right, and no human activity. And then on the other hand, you have human settlements, and those are places where you're not allowed to have any nature. I mean, you're allowed to, but we don't, right? And so we see these two things are just living apart from one another. And, and this is a problem, as I see it, because we are actually part of nature. And this means we're going to have, the best way is to, we have to learn how to integrate ourselves with nature. From a meditation perspective, you know, my grandmaster, my teacher from Shah Jahanpur in UP, you used to say, be simple and in tune with nature. But you have you know, maybe a holdover from the Victorian times, you know, when you see the British parks, right? They're lovely places and it's wonderful to have these parks. But at the same time, you see this uh, philosophy there in the, their organization of controlling nature, right? You have the promenade and on either side, you have nature which has been tamed. You know, this is our attitude towards it. I think that if we're going to understand how to integrate with nature, then we have to question what is our role? We have a role in nature and what is it? And if we have a role in it, then we have to <clears throat> realize that we also have a responsibility to it, right? So that's basically, I'll just say one more thing. I was reading a book about Sufism the other day where the author of the book was saying that the idea in Sufism, one idea in Sufism is that, uh, we have to look after and protect nature, right? And they made uh, mention of the Bible also, the idea that you know, humankind is given domain over nature. But even if this is true, even if that idea is true, suppose you have domain over your own children, 
does that mean that you have, can, uh, are free to abuse them, or does that mean that you're responsible for their upbringing? Right. So that's. So we have a responsibility, and we are integrated with nature. So my question to Mridula is: um, We talk about air, and James was telling us about how, of course, we are breathing all the time. It's something we do all the time. The quality of air impacts everybody a small child, an old person, but we are not able to really make a lot of change. So you've written a book on climate change, you've written a book on water, watersheds. Where do you think we are on the clean air conversation when it comes to climate action? Where are we? Are we anywhere? Are we, are we achieving anything? Because we are, of course, the most polluted cities on earth. Um, thank you. I, it's been a fascinating conversation. We're getting a whole bunch of perspectives on air, something that is invisible and available to all of us. But when I say available to all of us, it's not the same air that's available to all of us. And embedded in the conversation on air is the conversation on inequality. Um, the few times that I visited Delhi in November and December, um, you choke up. I come from Madurai where the air is cleaner and uh, you choke up and you know the moment you get into the car uh, it's like uh, you put on the air purifier in the car if you're so lucky you go home you have an air purifier in every room if you're lucky but um, uh, you know uh, Joshua just mentioned the ability to throw open windows and see blue sky but what about people whose homes don't have windows whether it's blue or gray or brown skies, their windows are always open because they don't have windows. And I think, you know, uh, that conversation needs to be part of the, uh, the conversation on air. The second aspect uh, is the climate and air aspect. The current climate change crisis, and the, yes, the climate has changed many times before, but this current rapid uh, change of climate is operating in the air, things we can't see. Uh, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, you know, the NOx gases, uh, many of the CFCs, HFCs, all of these you can't see, but they're blocking the heat emanating from the earth and they're heating up the planet, which we can see. We can see it in the language of water, in the rising cadence of storms and the paradoxically rising cadence of drought. But there is a paradox here. The one thing in air you can see is pollution right? The smog and all of that. And that is the most uncertain aspect of climate. But because we are humans, we think that is climate change. And when I teach my introduction to climate change class, I say, you know what? Pollution is not quite the same thing as heating up the planet. Paradoxically, it's very uncertain because pollution is a hodgepodge term. It's a bag which holds many things. And each of those pollutants are different. But taken all together, the pollution cleans, uh, sorry, it cools the planet. So we are in a little bit of a dicey situation because if we get rid of the pollution, the planet is expected to warm further. So I think that's something you need to sort of grapple with in your own mind. The last point I want to talk about is data. I came across, I came upon climate change in a very unorthodox fashion. And in my life before I came to this, data was king right? Data was everything. Granular, online data. And that's the one thing that's missing. And that's the one thing that can make the difference. Because if you're sitting in a position of power, and you want to solve Delhi's pollution problem, what is to blame? Especially when it's a nuanced answer. Is it vehicular pollution? Is it road dust? Is it PM10? Uh, Is it PM2.5? Is it volatile uh, organic compounds? Is it the stubble burning? Is it uh, something else altogether? Is it the lowering of the vertical height in which the pollutants mix? Is it just the weather? Is it the way the winds blow? And the answer is it's all of them. But when it's all of them and different people are to blame for different things, it provides a wonderful arena for lobbying to say, it's your fault, it's not my fault. And in a democracy, when I urge you, one of the things I always do is do Google Trends and tap whatever outrage point there is. And you see the spike and it comes down. 
And if the attention on this spikes only in November, and I've done this, you can, I mean, I've written about this many times, just comes up like this and then goes down. And then for the rest of the year, we're talking about other stuff or outreaching about other stuff. You know, it is manna from heaven for any leader because they will make soothing noises and it's fair. It's, it's a difficult job to balance things out. And if you're only going to care in November and not care come January, make the mewling noises and move on. Especially when so many of us have air uh, purifiers in our rooms. Why care? So, Joshua, in your book, um, The Heartfulness Way, you write about moving from the complexity of the mind to the simplicity of the heart. And you've also said to be simple is not always easy. It's, it's, it, simplicity doesn't mean something that's coming very easy. We are living in an age of anxiety. Uh, the freedom to breathe, as, as Mridula said, is often something that doesn't come so easy. We have inequalities, we have, we have a sense of impending gloom and doom, especially after the pandemic. Can you tell us a bit more about moving from the complexity of the mind to the simplicity of the heart and how it has helped you? Okay, so I'll try to keep it within the frame of this topic also, if possible. But... <clears throat> See, what I'm trying to, you know, what we're trying to achieve here in, in a sort of grand scale, which, you see, we have to have this understanding that we can transform individuals at an individual level. You know, we can't transform a society of people. When we're talking about interchange, right, that's at an individual level. Of course, society is made up of individuals, so that's the approach we take. Now, from myself, from my own perspective as a meditator, right, if I'm trying to see the ways that I have changed, I'll say that I used to make much bigger mistakes. And now my mistakes are maybe a bit better than they used to be, hopefully a bit smaller than they used to be. And you know, if I look five years in the future and I'm looking back, maybe I hopefully will be able to say that about this moment too, you know, and all my foolishness now, I'll be able to see that in perspective because there'll be a progression. What that means is an increase of awareness. And increase of awareness doesn't mean increase of intelligence. Mm -hmm. The increase of awareness I'm speaking of is, it has to do with your conscience, most of all. And that's when I'm talking about heart. Because your heart knows, your heart always tells you whether you should do something or you shouldn't do something, if you're willing to listen to it and trained to listen to it. So this is about creating awareness. And if you're looking about the issues of not just pollution, but all of the ills in, in this age, can you imagine, and I'm not a Buddhist, but just say, because he's an iconic figure, take the Buddha, right? Can you imagine him dumping chemicals into a river? Can you imagine him bombing civilians somewhere? Can you imagine him assign all of these evils that we see to this person who's supposed to be have such heightened awareness. The two things don't go together. And that's why they don't go together, because of this awareness. So at one level, I'm speaking about preventative you know, approach and a curative approach. Curative approach is necessary. I'm not qualified to talk about all of the curative approaches, because these are highly technical things, right? A curative approach is necessary when you're sick. And of course, we have sickness in our society right, in our civilization. But preventative approach is also necessary, and it has its place. And preventative approach is about developing a culture of awareness. And for me, a culture of awareness means a culture of heartfulness, because this is uh, this essential awareness, as I've just mentioned, has to do with, you know, how we treat each other and how we, uh, how in tune we are with our conscience. You know, so this is, I think, what we achieve when we meditate, at least when I meditate with this uh, meditation that I practice. And it teaches me to become more uh, aware of the effects of my actions, the probable effects of my actions, and gives me the, you know, the urge to continue changing myself, to continue trying to evolve myself, because I see the necessity of it. And 
because of that, because I see the importance and because you develop awareness, you want to help others to do that as well. So for that reason, I mean, we teach on a volunteer basis. We're teaching people in you know, thousands of schools across uh, this country, thousands of corporations. We're trying to cover you know, every district in India. And this is something that we just have to offer for free because and I'm talking about district in terms of villages now, going to every village. And this is something you have to offer for free because I think that it's a service. And, and you can't charge for such things, right? So this is, uh, this is I think, the role. That's so beautiful. A service can't come for a cost. That's lovely. No, because you see people making lots of money out of these things on the, you know, with the idea of helping to uplift society, but it's really a scam. <laughs> That's a very quotable quote. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mridula, we, we need to talk about the stubble burning in Punjab and Haryana and other places, Uttar Pradesh as well. You spoke about how we outrage on air pollution only in November, around the time of Diwali when the fields are being burnt. Obviously, you know, and that's also a very unequal conversation because it's people in Delhi complaining about farmers uh, trying to sow their second crop. So how do we approach this problem in your view? Um, okay. So in my second book, I actually wrote about the crisis of air and water. And I think it's uh, to understand why we got there. Uh, a good analogy is to actually use COVID as an analogy, right? But to think about the role that stubble burning uh, plays in the pollution problem of Delhi. Yes, uh, you know, in COVID, in the peak in April in Delhi, it was not the number of doctors that made the difference. That was not the bottleneck factor. What made the difference was oxygen, right? The availability of oxygen and whether or not you had a cylinder with you. And uh, that's like stubble burning in a sense. It's, um, uh, the pollution has a number of factors, vehicular pollution, road dust, construction debris, but those are like the doctors, nurses, the availability of medical care in charging the uh, healthcare um, infrastructure of a country. They're all important. They're, they're very, very important. But in the spike, the COVID spike, what made the difference was not the number of doctors, it was the oxygen. Same way in the spike in Delhi's pollution, the inventory data shows us that stubble burning uh, plays a very significant role. So if we want to address the spike, we have to address this stubble burning. So then you ask, when did it happen? Why does it happen? Because sort of going and figuring out, it's very easy to give solutions without, if you don't understand what drove it, the solutions are not going to stick. So when I started looking at it, that took me back 4,000 years um, to the Indus Valley civilization. And um, there's a fascinating set of studies that looked at what Indus Valley farmers grew and that area overlapped some of the Northwest of India. And these studies looked at what, is, what farmers grew and where they grew it and why they changed, right? So the farmers in that region grew millets in the summer and wheat or barley in the winter depending on how the climate changed over a thousand years in the Indus Valley civilization, they switched between wheat and barley. When climate uh, uh, permitted, they grew rice, they grew cotton. And, but the, the fact was they grew what the water allowed them to grow. And that was a consonance that was there in our mind. And that continued for centuries. And it made India very, very wealthy because they, they cracked the agriculture piece and that gave them wealth. And then the British came along. And there was a thinking that, you know, irrigation was very poor and that comes out very clearly in the writings of Francois Bernier, who was a Frenchman. But anyway, that's a, there's more of him in the book, He's an interesting character. But the British said, you know what? Irrigation is very poor. So why don't we build the canals? 
And why don't we bring water and clear the forest and create new land to grow new crops? And you know, by the way, we'll change the system of taxation. Until then, tax was always variable. And what a variable crop meant is when it was dry times, you paid less tax because you had less tax. And when, when it was wet, uh, when it's good rains, you paid more. The British said, you know what, we'll, we'll lower the tax. But it'll be fixed. And anyone who attended the session yesterday will find out that India's water varies tremendously from year to year uh, under the influence of El Nino and La Nina, etc. So that was a recipe for disaster. But they said, no, 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 we will make it fixed. And they did it in Punjab. And there's, there's beautiful writings of the settlement officer who came there and he said, you know, this was really bad. And he, they also made it a cash tax. And a ca so there were these peasants who had never handled coin in their life. And they were now being asked to handle cash and pay cash. And when there was a drought here, they had to borrow. And that was the rise of the middleman, the, the lender in Indian agriculture. So now you're beginning to grow what you can sell for cash, right? So the rise of cash crops, the rise of wheat, and very importantly for the farmer, that water doesn't, the what, local water availability doesn't matter in what you choose to grow. And I think if you don't recognize the seed, you're never going to solve the stubble burning problem. Because today in Punjab and Haryana, you get between 400 and 700 millimeters of rain a year on average. An average is a bad term to use with India's volatile water. But you're, gr taking, you're growing a crop that needs 1,240 millimeters of rain. And you're bridging that gap with groundwater. Right? Those, that seed of philosophy, if you don't acknowledge that seed of philosophy, your solution is never going to stick. But then let's force forward. The British have been gone for 75 years. And it's pointless to blame them. Now let us come to the Green Revolution. And America enters the story there. India in the back-to-back 64-65 -back wars lived ship to mouth because we'd grown used to American wheat, which was very cheap. And the urban palates had gotten used to rotis. You know, I grew up with uh, Kepe and Ragi and all of that. But anyway, older, you guys are all used to Atta. And suddenly we had a drought and we needed the wheat and we were living ship to mouth and we had to beg for the wheat. And it put a, I think there's a quote from Nehru that said, you know, we can never be, and I'm paraphrasing here, we can never be f truly free until we are free in food. And that's very important. We, and in, in the age of climate change, it's very important to be self-independent uh, in terms of food. So the Green Revolution seemed custom-made to become free. And again, technology came in, right? And um, the bore well was charged on a flat basis, so you could run it however much you wanted. That is a wonderful study by an American anthropologist on how a Punjabi village transformed in 13 years from, you know, what crops they grew. And because they were asked to use water as though there was no end, they became very profligate. And it'll take two more minutes. And slowly the groundwater table began to drop. And they went in for more and more powerful pumps. And one day they thought the groundwater was going to run out. So they passed a law saying, um, let's postpone the sowing to uh, conserve our groundwater. And that reduced the gap between the harvesting of the rice to the planting of the wheat to 10 days to 14, uh, 10 to 14 days. And the quickest and cheapest way to clear the crop was to burn it. And that led to the cloudy skies over Delhi, the spike. So it's a political economy that's pushing the change in the cropping pattern. And it, it would be good for us to think about changing our crops, changing the way that we sow them. And looking at crops, just what cash crops should be grown where is also an important issue. I'm going to throw the floor open for questions. But before that, I have to ask Joshua. He's a Western classical musician, for those who don't know, and he's played with A.R. Rahman many times. You have to tell us how that was. How that works? How that was. How that was. Oh, OK. Well, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of but... Rahman fans here. Oh, so okay. to tell us a little more. Well, I 
I was going to school in London, finishing up my master's degree. I met A.R. Rahman there, and uh, he invited me to come teach at his school in Chennai, and so I did. And when I was in Chennai, I, since I was there, I would also play the solos in the films for you know, two years. So, you know, and that was always at night, as everybody knows, I think. So, that, yeah, it was a wonderful Fabulous. time. This is why I love this panel. It's so unexpected. I'm going to uh, open the floor for questions. And can someone tell me if James Nestor is still with us? Is James Nestor still with us? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. So let's take questions. The gentleman in the middle. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Ritula, question for you. Actually, two questions. Keep it short. Can you? Uh, yeah, please. We are almost out of time. So really short. Yeah, yeah very short questions. Uh, first question. In the, just the last sentence that you mentioned, is it intentional that you did not name companies like Monsanto? Uh, when we were talking about shifting of uh, crop cycles, etc., was that intentional? Uh, because Monsanto is famous for paying off governments, and in this case, there were reports that uh, Monsanto paid off the Punjab government to shift that. Second question: uh, Angel investor to angel investor, have you looked at uh, you know uh, investments in uh, companies which are replacing animal agriculture, dependence on animal agriculture? Thank you. We'll have to take that really quickly. Um, okay, so uh, on Monsanto, I think, look, shifting, it's a very political thing. There are a lot of players involved in there. Uh, I'm not aware of Monsanto's role. Uh, I know them in their cotton role. I don't know them in their wheat rice role. I'm not saying it's not there, but I don't know. So I'll hold off on that. Angel investor to angel investor. Look, we are talking that um, we are asking farmers to shift crops without giving them any guarantee on demand. And I think that's foolish. Um, one of the companies that I have invested in, it's in the book also, works with Punjabi farmers with an NGO to help them conserve water. And they conserve water. It's 3,000 farmers, so it's not a small number. And, but gets them a sustainable tag when they want to export. So it gives them a premium. So I think that aligns interest. So I hope that answers your question. I hope that is, yes. Is there a question for Joshua? Yes. Person in the front, thanks. Hello. Good morning to everyone. My question is not particular to Mr. Joshua. It's a like, general question. Anyone can answer. My question is about what Mr. Rajapaksha, the president of Sri Lanka, was doing in the Sri Lanka, like he is going all pure and organic farming. So how does it affect the climate? Please. Okay, um, okay. so it's a, it's a great question. And Sri Lanka is suffering because of that, right? So I think you have to be very careful about what is climate and what you want to put your finger on because it's a messy topic with lots of influences. The thing about organic farming is it helps you with your soil health. And we don't understand soil well enough to understand how soil emissions are affected by, um, you know, chemical fertilizers, for the lack of a better word, and organic thing. I know personally that compost is black gold, right? So if you use compost, it does wonderful things for soil health. It's great for water. But the kicker in organic farming is that yields usually come down. Not always, but usually. And I know that's in cotton. And the problem is when yields come down and you're using everything else the same, especially land. And if you're clearing land to grow more organic, uh, especially when you're taking out forest to grow organic, I think you're in, it's, it, I don't have a simple answer for you because it's not a simple thing. And I'll tell you what everybody hates, it depends. But I think you have to be aware. I try to eat organic food because in the health side of things, it's a no brainer. But I think, you know, there are issues in certification. I know in organic cotton, until a few years ago, it was considered the biggest scam of all time because people will give you organic certificate if you just pay for it. So, you know, it's, it's complicated. It's a good thing to aspire for. But it's, with all good things, you have to be a little careful. My last question is for Josh. How can we be more heartful in our daily lives? Well, meditate. I mean, it's a technique. It's a technique that puts you in touch with that aspect of your being. So, you know, that's what I have to say. Uh, along the lines of what you were saying, two questions back also, 
I think ex placing expectations on people generally, or farmers, as you were mentioning, to change their behavior is really only a moral thing to do if also you offer assistance. So I think that's an important point that you just made. And regarding the question uh, earlier about, uh, well, actually your comment earlier about the freedom to be able to leave a place that's polluted versus people who don't have that choice. That's another issue like that. I, you know, I had, I went to the doctor. I breathed in one of those tube things, right? I forget what this test is called. Yeah, 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 thank you. Um, and they say, they look at the results, they say, uh, you should move to someplace else. <laughs> and I said, and I said, I said, okay, well, I mean, I have the possibility of doing that. I have the possibility. But even if I do move to someplace else, I mean, ultimately, we have one planet, no? I mean, how many, how many someplace else's are there? If we continue on this track, there is no place. I'm not, let's not bring Elon Musk into this, you know? So this is the place we have, you know, so. We are not Elon Musk. That's a great way to end. And yes, we only have one planet. As someone who lives in Delhi myself, it's something I think about quite a bit, the fact that I'm not going to leave. I love Delhi, I love its people. And maybe being more meditative in my daily life will help me overcome some issues in terms of living with Delhi. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much to the audience. Thank you. It's such an important topic, but I hope we've started a conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Mridra Ramesh, Joshua Pollock, and Neha Sinha, and James Nestor, who was with us online. We thank Michael Rosenthal and the Embassy of United States of America in India for their support. Thank you.